Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Simon Phipps joins me. We're going to talk about Sonata, a project that helps you translate all the prompts in your program to whatever language you need to translate them in. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps. Episode 233, recorded November 21st, 2012. Zanata. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open-source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the big shows, the little shows, the big shows, the big projects, the little projects, the movers, the shakers, stuff you might never have heard of, stuff you might have heard of every week or every day as you're using it. I don't know where this show's going to fall in, but probably some of you have heard of this project. It's the Zanata Project. But before I talk about the Zanata Project, I'm sorry, Simon Phipps, welcome back to the show. Uh, it's great to see you again, Randall. Hello. I'm from darkest Southampton in the south of England, where I'm. Uh, there's just me and uh, some sort of bug that I picked up on my trip to Italy last week to uh, the uh, free software conference in Bolzano in South Tyrol. And I'm sitting here nursing it and trying to avoid it taking over the planet. Okay, okay. Well, at least we're only Skyping. We're not. There's no other protocol that actually transmits bugs like that, so we should be okay. And for those yeah, of you watching... Sorry, go ahead. That's right. I'm assuming that you have an antivirus installed over there anyway, so you'll have no problems from me. But Linux doesn't need antiviruses, and neither does OS X. Why should I put but, one in? Well, you're running, you're running Skype. That's software from Microsoft to invent viruses. Oh, God. Okay, you're right. You're right. So uh, those of you watching the video may see that I'm actually in a slightly different location than I've been recently. Uh, last week's show, which unfortunately was canceled at the last minute, was supposed to be my last show uh, at Media Temple. So you won't see the big Media Temple microphone anymore or anything like that. I'm actually starting a new client next week. So I'll tell you more about that once I get on site. Uh, I'm actually at the house of Captain Neil, the guy who puts together all those wonderful insight cruises that I spend six or seven weeks a year on. So um, uh, he's uh, graciously let me uh, borrow his living room for a little bit of time. I've been busy working on his website for the last few days, so uh, I'm going to get right back to that as soon as we get it all done with taping here. But um, let's see. So let's talk about today's project. It's Zanata. Zanata, Zanata, something like that. We're going to get David Mason on. He's going to talk about Zanata. And Zanata is a translation framework. So you know, when you have when you write a piece of computer software and it has to have prompts and stuff in whatever the native language is, uh, you know, it's, it's you have to be able to, um, you know, to to translate in other languages so other people can use it. They don't speak the language you do, and so there's a bunch of frameworks that are already in the software to do this. But then you have to actually get people involved and get the prompts to be changed, and this sort of makes it all handy because it's all sort of a web interface and that sort of thing. Have you uh, looked at Zanat at all, uh, Simon? No, this was the first time I'd heard about it when I got the rundown from you for the show. Uh, mm -hmm. I took a quick look. Um, it looks like it's pretty niche. Uh, it's got a fairly small development team. So I'm going to mm -hmm. be interested to uh, hear from them about the project and uh, what its relationship is to Poodle, which is the tool that I'm uh, familiar with for doing translations. Yeah, yeah, and it's too bad like, because last week was supposed to be Poodle, which we could have then compared because like, it's also in a similar uh, space. So we could have compared the two, but uh, that's okay. We'll get the, we'll get Poodle back on, and they'll. Uh, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll uh, get to compare against Zanata now, because now we've done that first. So uh, I think what I'm going to say is, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on our guest. David Mason, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. I've been listening for a while. Cool. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm speaking from Brisbane in Australia at about 2.30 in the morning. Wow, thanks for uh, staying up late or getting up early or whatever you had to do to uh, be on the show then. And uh, I also noticed that that's probably going to be a little tiny bit of Skype delay, so I'll try not to uh, step on your answers or step on your, uh, your questions or whatever. So we'll see if we can get that to work. So at the beginning of the show, I gave a bit of an overview of what I could quickly discern in about a half hour of research what uh, Zanata is about. Would you please give us the 30,000-foot view and tell us what problem it's solving? Okay. Okay. Um well, the basic problem that it's solving is that um, translators want to translate text. And so what they really deal with is getting pieces of, of text in one language and converting that into another language. And ideally, that's all that they should have to deal with. Um, 
or if they're technical translators, then that and the technical domain in which they're translating. Um, and essentially, the, the concept of Zenata is that it allows uh, the people who are producing the strings to just put them out there uh, in a space where translators can access them. And then the translators can basically work in an environment that just gives them what they want, which is the strings, some information about similar strings, um, and um, that, that's pretty much the, the nuts and bolts of it. Not the nuts okay, and now, bolts. But, now by, yeah. by translation, you're talking about the strings that are used in prompts and other interfaces for programs, right? Yeah, well, we have uh, two main um, types of, of translation that are, um, that Zenata is used for at the moment, which is um, software translation, which would be things like command prompts, um, UI elements, um, and things like that. Um, but also documentation. Um, there's also a fair bit of documentation work that's translated. So that's taking um, a document, usually in an XML format, um, that's uh, sort of broken into paragraphs, and then those are translated. Okay, and how did uh, Zenata come about? Uh, it started in 2008. Um, Asgir was working at, uh, at Red Hat at the time, and um, traditionally uh, translation work has been um, done with uh, a, a few formats, and um, the get text format, which is PO files, uh, was used um, and, and has been quite popular. And um, initially, Zenata was just a way to parse a PO file, put it into an, a simple editor that allowed users or the translators to um, see the source string enter their translated string, and um, then it would generate um, the translated version of the PO file out of that. Uh, it's come a long way since then, but that was sort of where it, where it began. What's the interface that I'm using? You said something about get text. Can you describe a little bit more about what get text does? As a programmer, what am I writing in my program to say, please put the appropriate string for the prompt here? Okay, so get text uh, is um, available in most programming languages. And the basic idea is that uh, rather than put a literal string directly into your program. Let's say you have a, a prompt that's going to ask you how many hats you want. Um, mm -hmm. And so you'll have some text that says, how many hats would you like, question mark. And um, generally, uh, get text is aliased to just use an underscore. So the get text function will, will be um, sort of less uh, intrusive. And so you'll end up with something that's along the lines of underscore and then parentheses containing that string. So it, essentially, you add three characters around that, that literal string. So that's the first part of it, where you set your strings up for translation um, or for extraction, uh, ready for translation. Um, and then uh, you can run um, a get text utility, such as x get text, and that will extract those strings. So it'll basically look through the, the source. It'll find all the references to the get text function, pull those strings out into uh, what's called a pot file, which is a PO template file. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a, a fairly simple format. It has some headers to describe um, uh, to describe various metadata. And then each entry just has some comments, which can include um, things like source comments about um, how, it, how things should be translated. Uh, some context information. If you're uh, dealing with multiple files, it can pull them into a single um, pod file. Um, and then it'll have the, um, the message ID, which is just the extracted string. And then it'll have an empty, um, an empty message string, which is um, sort of a, a placeholder for where the translation will go. Um, and you can basically take that pod file copy it, change a few things in there, and then um, sort of you know, rename it and manually enter your translations for your um, language of choice into it. So that's, that's so the um, extraction side of things. And then mm -hmm. 
I think I'm, I'm going on a bit, so I'll just briefly go on, on the, the other side of things. So basically, once the translator has filled in all of the translations, sent the file back to you, it can be committed into source control, but then uh, it's essentially um, compiled into a, a Mo file, uh, which is then um, sort of part of the, the compiled application that will allow switching of, of locales and, and then um, that represents the resource that contains those strings. Okay, so like I'm starting with, obviously I'm going to be programming in English as my native language, so I would go ahead and write my application as if it, uh, it's, it's going to be just magically all in English. And then I put these little underscore things around there, and then I extract the stuff into the, I think you called it a PO file or whatever. Now, where does Zanata come in play then? Do I take these PO files and put them into Zanata somewhere so that people can look at them and, and uh, translate them to other languages? Um, sort of, except uh, there's a little bit more of abstraction there. So um, one of the big problems with uh, getting a, a PO file and then emailing it out to all of your various translators, um, like Red Hat Enterprise Linux is um, available in 22 languages at GA, so you've got at least 22 teams that you're sending your strings to. Mm -hmm. um, and that'll very quickly become a very complicated logistical operation, um, getting everything distributed, collecting it back, chasing up various teams. So um, basically what would happen uh, if you use Zanata as a developer, you will extract your strings into your pot file as, as normal, and then um, you'll have a, a Zanata configuration file in your project directory and run one of the uh, a command from one of the Zanata clients, and there are a few available, um, and that will essentially look through that pot file, look at all the strings in there, extract them, and send those off to the Zanata server, and then on the server, translators see those um, strings as or see those um, pot files just as generic documents. So they don't really need to know that it came from a a pod file. Uh, it could come from a Java properties file, um, could come from an XLIF file, um, and more recently it could come from plain text or um, any of the open document formats or, um, or a Mozilla DTD um, file, various, various formats. And then, um, but that's not really, that's just an implementation detail really and, and something that translators mm -hmm. shouldn't need to worry about. Um, and so they essentially, as far as they're concerned, are, are working with generic documents. Um, there are some complications um, with sort of character in, um, escaping and things like that where you sort of can't completely abstract all of that out. But in general, it, it um, tends to work quite well. And so now the once you've gotten into um, Zanata, then I, as a person speaking a different language, not me, but somebody else, I guess, uh, would see the English strings that I, the programmer, had created and some context for it, or, or I'm just looking just at the strings. I mean, how do, how, do we, how do we communicate that this is meant to be the command prompt for something, for example? Um, well, the most important context is, is the surrounding strings. And so we make sure that our editor um, displays strings in the order that we get them. Um, <laughs> And uh, which is uh, that, that's especially important for documentation. Um, so let me see. There's that, and then usually the context in in a um, a PO file or a pot file is um, it has a, a special type of comment which which gives the context, um, and so that is presented in the editor. Um, beyond that, it's it can be quite difficult to, so particularly for a compiled application, um, I don't think any tool is capable, um, at least to my knowledge, of, um, of compiling an application and showing the sort of the, the UI with, with the strings in directly to a translator. Um, there are a few things I've done recently for some formats that'll let you do that, sort of if you've got an open document uh, text. Um, text document, you can get a preview of that with the strings that you've entered. Um, 
but translators are, are used to working with um, software translation strings that um, they sort of can't see the UI uh, that it's presented in, and that's kind of something you have to uh, go and check after you've done your preliminary translations per project. Uh, uh, I'm interested, actually, what the relationship is between this and Poodle. Um, I've seen uh, within several of the projects that I've uh, taken an interest in that they're using Poodle as their translation server. Is there some relationship between what you're doing here and Poodle? I, it, it sounds like you've got files that have got a related uh, suffix, and they're either about cannabis or about something else. What are those pot files? Um, yeah, that there is a, a very strong relationship. Um, not not a um, not a communicative relationship. Um, basically, um, Poodle and Zanata do very very similar things, um, and as they evolve, they um, because they're covering this a similar problem domain, um, they seem to be drifting closer together in in the the features that they provide. So as far as the main difference between Poodle and Zanata, I haven't um, got a whole lot of recent experience uh, with Poodle. Um, and I was looking forward to the podcast schedule for last week uh, with them, but I'll have to wait for that one. Um, but, but the main difference be between the two is that ours is, um, Zanata's written in, in Java and, and Poodle is, uh, I believe, Python-based. Um, other than that, just uh, recently looking at, at uh, the, the sort of features they've got, uh, a lot of them have, uh, a lot of what they've, they seem to have done more recently is um, overlapping with a lot of our features, which means um, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens there with the, with the two projects. There's definitely a lot of room for, for a lot of back and forth there. Right. I mean, the, the reputation that Poodle has is for being very complicated to uh, configure and install. Uh, how, how simple is your code to get set up on a new project? Um, now, there are a few different options there. The simplest option is if you've got an open source project, then there's a um, central instance of Zenata, which is at zenata.org. Um, and uh, you can basically just, so you, you don't need to um, install anything. You can basically just uh, sign up to that instance and then um, push a project. So, so you create a project through the UI, create a, a version for that, um, and then you'll need to download a client, uh, although that's not completely necessary these days. Um, and um, then you can push your strings in there and then it's, it's there, set up, and um, and sort of away you go. Um, if you wanted to uh, sort of be a bit more secretive about it, then you can um, set up your own Zenata instance. Um, and um, one of our team members has made a, a downloadable um, package, which basically gives you Zenata along with the application server, which is JBoss, um, on which it runs. Um, and that's all basically ready to go. All you have to do is um, create the, the database uh, for it and um, fire it up. Right, right. So no, no, I'm, I'm known on uh, Floss Weekly for asking questions about governance. So uh, taking a look at your project uh, homepage, it looked like Red Hat had a really strong influence on this project. Uh, what is the relationship of the project to Red Hat? Basically, at the moment, the uh, vast, vast majority of um, the development work on the project is um, through Red Hat. Uh, the, the core development team are all um, employees of Red Hat, and we're all um, uh, now all based in the same office. We did have uh, another team member who was uh, in China, which uh, made for some slightly more complicated communication. Um, so. Basically, at, at the moment, um, we are steering the way that the, the project goes because um, we're basically um, writing all of the code and um, a lot of the, um, 
I'd say the majority of the users at this stage are um, Red Hat translators who are translating um, uh, Fedora, um, so various Fedora applications, um, as well as uh, our own um, enterprise Linux applications. Right. So going forward into the future, do you expect this project to be uh, more broad-based? Are you expecting there to be other contributors coming in, or are you pretty happy having this a, um, uh, largely a Red Hat-only project? Uh, we're, we're definitely keen to have uh, contributions from um, as many other people as possible. Uh, the, the, there are a few barriers to that at the moment, which are largely to do with the, the complexity of the, the code base. Um, because it's uh, a fairly large project, it can. Um, I definitely remember uh, when I started working on it. Uh, there was a quite a learning curve there, which sort of doesn't encourage um, sort of your your um, sort of basement dabbler to necessarily um, go through the effort to to learn what's where um, to be able to actually. Um, Sort of get to making a, a useful contribution, um, and that's something that I've been working on and that we've we've had in mind. Um, it's sort of a a balance between um, the time I need to spend writing code to implement features that that we need um, versus um, sort of improving documentation and um, and various other things to to try and make. The project more accessible to, to external contributions. Um, I think that's something that will that will come more with uh, with maturity of the project. Uh, you sort of um, over time, the, the code base becomes uh, sort of cleaner, better organised, more intuitive, um, and the uh, setup processes for development uh, get better and better documented. Um, and I think that's something that will mainly just take time. Um, I mean, right. it'll take effort over that time, but um, but it's not something that we could um, fix overnight, I think. Right, right. I see you're using CloudBees to uh, to do the, the build and test. How's that working out for you? Um, mixed results. Um, the main use of CloudBees at the moment is for their for their Maven repository that they provide. Um, we've moved most of our continuous integration builds to internal servers, um, largely because of the, um, the limits that CloudBees place on, um, on sort of a number of build hours and, and that kind of thing, um, which sort of didn't, didn't fit with what we wanted to do. We have, um, we tend to have quite a lot of builds running um, quite frequently to sort of make sure that everything's always um, in a not very broken state. Right. Um, actually, I've re recently also um, the Akapi project, which is a um, slightly related project, um, they've moved uh, their builds to. Oh, they moved to CloudBees or. Um, They've had a few issues um, with CloudBees that helped them sort through just to do with getting things set up. Um, but, but they've been hitting the same sort of problems that we were just with, um, with the build limits, which um, I think is to be expected unless you, you want to pay them money. So uh, I see you're using GitHub. That's usually a sign that you've got a, um, a, a pull request style of governance where there's no formal rules about who gets commit rights. It's all up to your uh, your master committers, of whom Olo seems to suggest you have about five people who are actively involved in the project. Uh, do, do you have a more formal view of your governance with formal membership and formal rules about who can commit? Or are you just sticking to that very relaxed GitHub pull request and we'll see if we like it approach? Um, to be honest, that hasn't really come up um, because uh, the commits that we have are all uh, from the core development team and um, generally most of the, the oh, hang on, let me, let me think about the external. Um, 
you know, sort of, if we were receiving um, pull requests frequently, then then that would be something to to consider. And, and um, we certainly would welcome any any commits. It's just um, something that um, you know that there, there, there aren't many. Uh, or, I don't want to say there aren't any because I have to remember whether. I know there have been a few bits and pieces of contributions, but but uh, certainly nothing uh, frequent, um, and a lot of those from people who have worked on the the project in the past. Um, so so basically just as a as a result of uh, the fact that um, all the commits are coming from the core development team, um, it sort of it hasn't been necessary to consider uh, what to do with commits from outside the development team. But essentially, if they um, if someone did uh, have a pull request, we would be more than happy to um, to review the code and, and include it. So earlier you mentioned the Okapi framework. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, that's, uh, the Okapi framework is um, uh, uh, addressing a different problem in the, the localization and internationalization space. So it's about uh, making automated pipelines um, which can sort of process documents, uh, sort of run them through translation memories in, in preparation for, um, for human translation uh, and do various other things um, with those. Um, and a copy is how I uh, sort of got in touch with the Zenata framework uh, so Asgir, who, who started Zenata, um, was uh, or, or still is a, a member of the development team for Akapi, and um, I made some contributions to, to Akapi in the past, and I haven't been as active uh, there more recently, um, mainly just because of how busy I've been, but I try to keep up with, with what's going on and um, on with them. And... Um, there's certainly a lot of opportunity there for um, for the Zenata framework to oh, sorry the Zenata project to use um, code from that framework, which which has happened um, recently. We've had a little bit of code of theirs um, for a while, but I've recently hooked it up so that um, I can use their code to enable um, translation of all of the open document formats um, and a few others. And um, the way that I've done it means that I can, I'll be able to, to add more formats quite quite easily in the future. And what attracted you initially to the Akapi and the, now the Zenata framework? What, uh, what's your background that uh, might overlap with that? Um, it was sort of a bit of an accident. Um, I've been interested in open source development for a Quite a long time, um, at least 15 years, um, but it's something that I sort of never uh, got around to. I sort of, I was young and did all sorts of things that don't really make sense now that I, now that I look back at it. I was going to think I was going to be a blacksmith at one point. Um, I completed a vet degree, so I'm a qualified veterinarian, um, <laughs> and. Um, so various other things, but I always found like the, during my vet degree, I, I was um, living with someone who was doing a, a game development degree, and so I found half the time I'd be down the hall, looking over his shoulder at what he was doing, um, and sort of finding that uh, very interesting. And um, eventually, I just had to admit to myself that what I really wanted to be doing was writing code, and so. Um, so I went and started doing that, and um, it was uh, during um, during my studies I, I ended up um, with an assignment, and one of the options uh, there was sort of some some standard options, and then there was a an interesting option, which was um, do work on an open source project, and the the, the subject was a, a localization one. So. Um, I talked to my lecturer and he put me in contact with the Akapi guys and um, sort of found some work that I could do that was suitable for the for the assessment and um, and then sort of just stuck with it after that. 
So you, you started as a code contributor to the open source project, or did you also help with translations? I understand you speak multiple languages. Um, I speak some words in multiple languages. I'm, I'm interested <laughs> in learning languages, but um, uh -huh. yeah, I, 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 yep. I think I can I can say that I don't speak about uh, five or six different <laughs> languages in in those how, languages. How many languages can you order a beer in? This is the uh, most important question. Ooh. Um, Maybe five, definitely oh, three. Um, I spend I mean, a bit of time make, in China. Makes you an um, essential it, traveling it, companion, and you know you, <laughs> you want to check, it, you want to scope out Randall a little bit here because he he needs that sort of help when he's out cruising. Yes, that is on that is on cruises, not cruising on the streets, which of course yeah, Randall a whole different thing. Right? Yes, yes. Um, so, 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 what was uh, so? How did you train yourself to be a programmer? Or did you actually take formal classes for that? Um, yes, I did. I didn't begin with uh, formal classes. Actually, some years ago, I guess it would be about um, well, as while I was at school, which was getting towards 15 years ago. Makes me feel a bit old. Um, I had, I loved all the, the programming um, classes I did um, back at school. Um, and I was actually, I, I decided to be a programmer back then, but I'm not sure what happened, but I... So I've ended up on a, on a different path, but um, there was a actually a game, um, sort of a British-made one um, called Creatures, which um, was just about having little, cute little things and teaching them to to speak and using reward and punishment to train them to, you know, to eat so they don't starve to death and um, and various things like that and. Um, that was actually sort of my introduction to programming was making objects for for the world in which they lived. Um, mm. So I played around a lot with that back then, um, which which was interesting because it it meant that I was starting from a very object oriented um, place, and so it, it's odd to me now when people have have trouble understanding sort of moving from procedural to um, to object-oriented programming because it's just um, because I had that beginning, um, and then in the intervening time, I basically sort of played around with um, a bunch of web stuff and sort of taught myself PHP, taught myself JavaScript, taught myself C sharp, taught myself Java, um, and sort of tinkered with those. But um, yeah, when I just uh, when I decided to, to do, do it as a career, um, I uh, took on a master's and um, and did that, which was really valuable, basically just to mainly for the tools that it sort of showed me were out there and um, a lot of the software patterns and things that you sort of, you don't get if you just um, learn how to how to write code. It's sort of only only a, a small bit of it. Um, must have. Must have worked. I got um, much higher marks in that than I did in my vet degree uh, by the end of it, anyway. Mm. Um, so, um, so, I was just going to ask, just just, just going to ask, <laughs> what's because I don't often get a chance to ask this of anyone. What's the biggest difference between being a programmer and being a veterinarian? The biggest difference for me <laughs> is that as a veterinarian. You generally start with something that is below average and the best that you can possibly do, and this is in the 10% of cases where what you do actually makes a difference, is bring them back up to average. So you take an animal that's sick and you make them not sick anymore. Um, whereas in programming, you basically start with something that either doesn't exist or might be average and improve it and keep on improving on it and make something better and better and you make something that, that's never existed before. Um, so basically it's, it's the difference between um, generally a fixing and sort of investigative and fixing approach versus a creative approach. Uh, so that, for me, is the biggest difference. There, there are a lot of other differences that, that led to the, the change in career, uh, sort of to do with 
working conditions and a lot of that's so specific to the industry in Australia um, and um, attitudes and, and things like that. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, it boiled down to I want to be creating something and um, if I'm not doing that, then I'm not really happy. And I also, I should have asked you this too, were you a small animal vet or a big animal vet? Um, I was aiming for a small animal um, surgical um, sort of direction. So I probably would have um, gone to uh, North America and studied in that if I'd stuck with it, uh, basically because um, general practice although it's based on very interesting science, which I loved while I was learning it, um, can tend to get quite um, repetitive with, with sort of the common conditions being very common and um, often not requiring sort of a really thorough investigation. So you sort of have to make do with just treating the symptoms for a lot of things and only really take the expense to look into it if... Um, if it doesn't sort of get, get fixed. Yep. And uh, probably with programming, I could probably guess that you get bit a little less often too, right? A lot less often. Um, <laughs> definitely a lot less often. Get, get bitten a lot less, um, a lot less kicks um, and scratches. So, so that's yeah. all positive. That, that sounds like yeah, an uptake, definitely. Go ahead, Simon. It, it, all, it all becomes virtual. You know, you get, it's dealing with trolls and dealing with, uh, with being, being bitten on mailing lists. I'm sure the internal attitude of the soul has to be the same. Yeah. I guess when it boils down to it, that, uh, that does apply. Well, a couple but more that questions. Usually can't kill you. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying that that usually can't kill you. That, that was yeah. another a big deterrent was that you could just accidentally die, which is a lot less likely to happen with a computer. Yeah. Although still yes. possible if you use your imagination. So I just want to ask a couple more questions about Zenata as, as we can start to wrap up here. Um, so what's, what's the future for Zenata? How, how is it going to play out? Uh, I, I, I understand you're trying to get more contributors from the outside, maybe move it more towards a traditional open source model. But uh, what else is, well, what's still missing on the roadmap for features? Um, well, we have, if we add it up, we have at least... A couple of years worth of, of feature requests. Uh, so we sort of churn through those as quickly as we can and try and prioritize um, as best we can. Um, I think I have a list here somewhere. Um, I was thinking about this earlier and didn't want to, to miss too much. Um, so at the moment, we're working on performance and stability. Um, as we get bigger, as we get more users and more projects, that's becoming more and more of a, of a concern. Um, something we want to make sure that isn't going to be slowing people down. And we'll also be looking at um, so being able to move to bigger um, server architectures, things like uh, sharding, um, that kind of thing. Um, we've got a new client coming along that shouldn't be too different from the old one. Um, but it will, um, that'll help us. I've got a, a student project that I, um, that I supervised, which was a, a synchronization client that will, um, it, it needs a bit more work and I'm aiming to get that done by early next year. Um, that will let uh, translators work um, on the desktop um, if they um, don't want to work in the web app or if they need to go offline for um, for some amount of time, um, that'll help keep everything synced with the server uh, as quickly as possible without them having to worry about it. Because uh, an issue with offline translation is you can have um, things getting out of sync between the translator's workspace and the, the central server. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to push forward. Um, we're aiming to do more community outreach. Um, for me personally, that means... Um, documenting our development a lot more um, so that if someone does want to develop, they've got a, sort of some stuff they can read through that'll help them be able to actually get in and start writing code. Um, 
I'm also always on the lookout for interested students. Um, so anyone in the, the Brisbane area, we are taking interns. Um, and oh, what else? Um, there are lots and lots and lots of sort of features that we that we're looking at, at adding. But I guess to mention a few, we're looking at um, user spaces, so that um, the idea is at the moment everything is um, every every document fits within a project, which is managed by the project maintainer, who would be the um, developer of a piece of software or the author of some documentation. Um, uh, this would allow a translator to have their own workspace where they can take a document that they need to translate that might not necessarily be in Zenata and they can upload that, translate it with Zenata and then um, download it again um, to help them uh, be able to work in a consistent environment um, rather than have to switch to a different tool just because they're, they're doing something different. Um, and another big area we're looking at is um, improving the glossaries. So at the moment, they're fairly straightforward. Sort of here's a word, here's a definition, but there's a lot more that can be done with that um, to do with allowing editing and sort of comparison between different languages um, and things like that. Um, and if I, if I go any longer, I'll go on all night. So that'll <laughs> uh, so, do. Uh, yeah, so uh, earlier you said that uh, I could install this by downloading it and installing it on my own system, but you had a hosted solution at sonata.org, and I only had to register there and upload my project, my text files. Um, are there volunteer translators that would help me out in other languages, or do I also need to bring all the humans that I need to do something on sonata.org? Um, Essentially, it comes down to um, there are translators um, who are working on, on Sonata.org. Um, many of them are uh, employed by Red Hat at the moment, um, but uh, there are others um, who are affiliated with the, with the Fedora project. Um, and basically, it boils down to letting them know that your project is there and, um, and getting them interested in, in translating it. Um, that's another area that we can, in which we can do more to um, sort of allow translators to discover um, new projects or projects. You know, if, if they just want to contribute some translations, um, um, or, you know, get some practice or anything, then uh, allow them to discover your project. I mean, it's on the the main project list, um, but I'm sure there's more that we can do in that area. Um, if you want to get it um, fully translated in sort of in a hurry, then definitely getting getting your own people to um, to get on board and do that it would, would be necessary. Um, yeah, as is the case with any anything in open source, um, you'll you'll take what you can get uh, from from volunteers, but you really need to um, encourage people to to contribute if you want to get. A lot done. Now, so you have people that are on Red Hat staff that do some of the translation. I'm clearly for Red Hat projects. Um, do you have volunteers also working on um, Red Hat projects? And uh, if so, uh, are you missing any languages that you'd like people to step up for that might be listening to this show? Um, well, let's see. I'm usually busy looking at the code and not um, <laughs> not too closely at at who's translating, but. Um, for our um, for our so internal products, um, we have an internal instance that's used for that, um, and so um, a lot of what's on um, Zenata.org, uh, it, it's uh, usually not our, not our um, internal projects, but um, more on the Fedora side of things. Um, definitely from um, from seeing the user list and, and from um, handling requests for, for joining language teams, um, and there are definitely users there who aren't using Red Hat email addresses. Um, so, but I can't I can't tell without investigating whether they um, whether they might be Red Hat 
um, people who are just using their personal email address or their Fedora address to um, sort of in that in that context. Um, basically, it boils down to um, I don't have that information, but um, okay. I'm sure there are um, some. But I, I definitely can't give give numbers. On That's that. fine. That's fine. Uh, and so, and so, when you say internal projects, you're talking about Rail and JBoss and things like that. Yeah, yeah, things like that. Um, and I've just got a um, uh, a message here from the product owner who um, is a, a translator um, who um, sort of makes the um, so it has the has the final say in in what features are top priority at the time. Um, She's noted that Sonata.org projects are open to all, and um, anyone can step up for any language of their choice. Um, even Klingon, apparently. Do we oh, yeah. <laughs> um, actually, yes, we do. I remember seeing that, that language code in there. So, um, yeah, there's definitely no restriction um, on, on who, can, who can translate. Um, and I'm pretty sure there was some call for, for hiring um, translators, at least for the, for the Brisbane office. If there are any translators out there who are in the Brisbane area and maybe um, looking for work. Um, I saw something across my email about that. Um, but yeah, as far as Zenata.org, um, if you know more than one language, then you can probably get involved. Very cool, very cool. Well, we're just about out of time. I just wanted to ask you, is there anything that we didn't ask you that uh, you'd like to make sure our audience is aware of? I think I made a list for this as well. Um, <laughs> yes, there's a list you sent us. I think we covered everything there, so. <laughs> I, figured, I figured by three in the morning I, I would have trouble remembering <laughs> things, so. Um, Oh, maybe I've lost it. <laughs> Hopefully not in more ways than one. <laughs> anyway, what have we got? I mean, I, there's I always the, the fallback of... Um, the, the two of, standard um, questions. Yes. Need to ask the two standard questions. What's your favorite uh, scripting language? Now, for this one, I'm going to say Python. Um, the main fine. reason I'm not saying Perl is because I haven't used Perl. Um, well, I, I've sort of done Hello World, and that's about as far as I've gotten. Uh -huh. um, so I sort of Python um, at the same time as trying to figure out how OLPC was structured, how, how the Sugar OS worked, which was interesting. But yeah, there are some things I like about Python. Cool. Yeah, no problem. I, people like Python are fine with me. It's just, uh, you know, whatever works for everybody is whatever works for everybody. So uh, also then your favorite uh, text editor of some kind. Um, well, I mean, if I'm if I'm choosing bet between Emacs and and Vi, then it has to be Vi because I, again because I haven't used Emacs, um, and um, I have a few others I use, but nothing that really stands out. There we go. All right, good. Well, uh, I appreciate you staying up until what is now 3 a.m., 3.15 a.m. for you, because uh, that's something I would rarely do <laughs> just to be interviewed, but I appreciate you doing that, and, uh, and hope you'll, you'll probably fall asleep real quickly after this, I can imagine. So uh, thank you very much for joining the show. Most welcome. My pleasure. Very good. That was David Mason, who has been a member of the Zanata's core development team for about the last 16 months and talked a lot about uh, what Zanata does and also about what being a veterinarian is about. So, uh, Simon, what do you think? Uh, it's got these seeds of being an interesting project. Um, you know, looking at it there, I'd say that... Uh, I just stop my phone from ringing here. There we go. <laughs> As, uh, yes. uh, I'd say it's got the seeds of being an interesting project. Uh, I had a look at the OLO statistics for it, and um, uh, there's really just uh, a group of five people at Red Hat working on it. Um, yeah, so yeah. It, it, I think in order to get some legs and go someplace, it's got to find some more people, maybe from the audience today, to go take a look at it and find that it's interesting. Um, but I, I, you know, I think that the, it looks like it, it fits in well into a continuous integration environment. Uh, being a Java application, you know, it's going to work well alongside a whole lot of other Java infrastructure. So I, I wish them well. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing if they're able to grow their community and, and go some other place.
Yeah, and anything I think that uh, you know helps out with this problem of just having language uh, or just having. You know, given that we're an international community, especially in open source, uh, you know, be having some way to collaborate and cooperate uh, on instead of just emailing .po files around, it, it, this is definitely a step up from that. And uh, yeah, you're right. I wish to, we could have got, uh, you know, last week's cancellation was sort of unfortunate, but uh, it would have been nice to also put the other project whose name I already forgot, Poodle, uh, Poodle. also against this. Yeah, to put that yeah. against this to see what that looked like. And uh, I know Poodle's going to come back on soon. We just haven't put the date in yet. I think it's actually coming up uh, first part of the of uh, January. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get them back on and uh, or on for the first time, actually, and do a nice comparison, A-B comparison with that. Uh, but, you know, there's also the other thing uh, that I think he referred to somewhere in the middle of the show, which is that... Um, that, you know, part of the reason it might not be catching on for outside contributors is because the code is just weird. You know, the code needs better documentation, better organization. And that's something I think to remember. I know that a lot of projects that might not necessarily know they're going to be open source at some point might take shortcuts in terms of development time and, uh, you know, not do the right do the right thing the first time inside the code base. And this is part of the cost of that. If you want to have more people contribute to it, it's got to be maintainable. And that's true even internally, but I think if, if you're only going to keep something internally, you tend not to think about uh, worrying about that because, you know, you, you know anybody that's going to work on the code, you can just walk down to the next cubicle over and say, well, how did that code work for you? Um, but when you open source it, man, somebody could be somebody halfway around the world that uh, needs to, you know, make a change or patch or something without having good internal documentation, good organization, that's not really possible. So, right. Yeah, the other thing that would be interesting to find out would be how uh, translators actually get on with it. Um, because I, I've watched uh, the LibreOffice project setting up its translation environment. And it, it's actually interesting to see how uh, translators have got their own way of working and their own uh, social approach to dealing with translations. And uh, I could imagine that without somebody to deal with all the technical complexity of, of the code, you might well discover that uh, a, a group of people whose role in a project is translation rather than directly being responsible for core coding might find it uh, too complex to take on and uh, instantiate. So I, I think if they want to grow the, the project, they, they need to ask themselves some questions about that complexity and about the approachability of the project for translators. Yeah, sounds like a good thing there. Well, uh, let's go ahead and look at what we've got coming, since I mentioned that a moment ago. Next week, we have the Foreman, which manages a startup for provisioning hosts. I believe that's another Red Hat project, so I guess we've got another couple of Red Hat projects in a row. Uh, Broadleaf Commerce, which is going to be the week where you want to bring your Dilbert bingo card, because it's the fully customizable open source e-commerce framework designer. <sighs> okay. Buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. I love those. Okay. Uh, the following two weeks are web frameworks of various kinds. We have Cake PHP, a very popular PHP framework. I won't know much. I don't know much about PHP, but uh, I know it was originally written in Perl. It's the only thing I know about PHP, but apparently it's a very popular uh, web framework called Cake PHP. And then Yesod or Yesod. I don't know how to pronounce that, but there we go. And that's a web framework written in Haskell, which is uh, another language I've tried to learn seven times. And each time I stop when they start using uh, scholarly terms that are not in my background. Um, yes. We have no. Yeah, I know. We have no show for December 26th. Uh, the Twit Brick House is taking the week off, so I will also be taking the week off. Uh, and then we'll be right back first of the year. We're going to get Node.js back on. I know we had to cancel with that before because of the last-minute scheduling conflict, but Node.js has been rescheduled for the first show of the new year, January 2nd. So looking forward to all those upcoming shows. I'll be scheduling more shows for Q1. I've just opened up the dates for Q1. I'll be scheduling more shows uh, for Q1 and let you know about them. If you follow us, uh, if you go to the big spreadsheet at twit.com, TV slash Floss. You can see our upcoming shows. You can also follow us at Floss Weekly on Google+. Plus. I post things there regularly about what's going on in terms of new guests and upcoming guests. You can also follow Floss Weekly on both Identica and Twitter. I occasionally post messages there as well. We have a live chat that goes along with each show. Uh, we're at live.twit.tv. We tape this show at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays, which is what time it is right now here. Unfortunately, that was 2.30 in the morning in Brisbane. So, uh, sorry for that, uh, Mr. David there. Um, um, uh, uh, my birthday is tomorrow. We're taping this the day before Thanksgiving, so I turn 51 tomorrow, the big age there, and I'm actually flying from LAX to PDX, getting up at a, for a 6.05 a.m. flight, uh, just so I can be with my uh, family and friends uh, for, for my birthday and for Thanksgiving. So the things I do to get around. You can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. I'm also on Google Plus as Randall L. Schwartz. been posting a lot of really clever and interesting things there every day, so that's the enjoyable part of that. I think that's everything I want to plug for now. Simon, what do you want to say? 
I, I was just going to compliment you on how you're looking slim and healthy, actually, there, Randall. Oh, um, yeah. You're, today, you're down to 188 pounds, according to Twitter. Indeed, yeah. I've gone from 215 to 188 in the last uh, 13 weeks. Right. That's, and, and, you know, you're, you're looking slim and healthy, I have to tell you. Just on, that's a camera I, you know, effect. I, I, that, that's a I camera thought effect. It was a camera, I thought it was a camera <laughs> effect, but it's not. It's, it's actually for real up there. So uh, yeah, congratulations is. on that and keep it up. You're, you're, you're very, it's very inspiring following you on Twitter. Thank you. So uh, for me coming up, I've got uh, a visit over to Malaysia next week. If you're going to the Malaysian Government Open Source Conference, I'm giving the keynote on day two. That's the 27th of uh, November. And then after that, I'm home. And you can just follow my stuff by going to webmink.com. That's the URL on the screen if you're watching video. Um, and from there, you'll find links to my column in InfoWorld every Friday and uh, in Computer World occasionally in the UK. Uh, coming up in the spring, if you are somebody who goes to FOSDEM in Brussels, um, FOSDEM is uh, on the 2nd and 3rd of February in 2013. And the call for papers for all the dev rooms is open at the moment. So you need to go right now to go look at the uh, dev room schedule and get your paper submissions in so that I can see you in FOSDEM in Brussels in the uh, first weekend in February in 2013. Apart from that, I'd like to uh, wish uh, all of my American friends a very happy Thanksgiving. Um, the rest of the world is very thankful for the reduction in the amount of email that we'll be getting on Thursday and Friday. So thank you for that. Indeed, indeed. And uh, and thank you, Simon, for uh, crawling out of your, not, I was going to say deathbed, but no, your sick bed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Because um, yeah, I know at the last minute, uh, since I couldn't find a co-host that would replace you after you sent me the email, I, I'm glad that you were able to uh, step up anyway. I appreciate it very much. Uh, it's, I'm going to go crawl into bed now. So. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We've done the job. We can get out of here. We're on our way out. All right, Simon, thanks a lot, and we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.